Thank the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Great job as always. Appreciate it very much. Thank you all for your testimonies and uh, prayer requests. Thank you, Suzanne and Peter and Tammy for leading us in worship. Praise God. God is good. Amen. 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 Thank the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You know, uh, as a pastor, sometimes you get called on by people to, to do counseling. I've never felt adequate for that, so I generally, anybody that's had conversations with me know I just basically give them scriptures. I don't trust my counsel. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I've made enough mistakes in my life. I try to stay as close to the Word of God as I can. But something weird happened here a few years back, and uh, the couple I'm talking about are no longer here. In fact, they, I haven't seen them since, but uh, they came to me after church one time and asked if I would uh, uh, talk to them, and uh, they said that uh, his wife wanted to leave him. And I asked her, I said, well, <clears throat> what's, what's the matter? And she said, well, he's always pretending to be a transformer. You know those robot-like things that transform from one thing to another, you know, and she said, he's always pretending to be a transformer. And uh, I looked at him and he says, please don't leave me. I'll do anything. I'll do anything if you, if you just won't leave me. And so I looked at him and I said, do you really want to save your marriage? And he said, yes. And I said, then look your wife in the eye and tell her I can change. <laughs> I haven't seen him since, praise the Lord. So. I'm not sure how that worked out for him, but praise the Lord. So, some good advice this morning. Don't let your worries overwhelm you or get the best of you, because uh, if you remember, Moses started out as a basket case. <laughs> what, do you ha what do you call it when you have too many aliens? Extraterrestrials. <laughs> Anybody know what happened when the semicolon broke the grammar laws? He was given two consecutive sentences. <laughs> Have you seen those pictures of Napoleon in this, you know, this pristine kind of, you know, military coat, you know? Well, I found that he, he may not have designed the coat, but he did have a hand in it. <laughs> okay, Peter's holding his head. That's time to move on, I think. Praise God. It's time to wake up. As a groaner, but yeah. Okay, praise the Lord. Let's, let's start this morning. I want to begin in Psalms chapter 14 and verse 1. How many of you that uh, I prayed for last week have had something come up to deny what I prayed? Some thoughts, some experience, something kind of telling you, no, that ain't going to happen. The enemy immediately comes for the word. Yeah. So whatever you're praying, if you're praying in the, in the word or using the word as a basis for your prayer, which I hope you are, uh, you can bet that the enemy is going to come and try to bring some natural thing, some physical sense, sight, hearing, touching, experiencing, what have you to deny whatever it is God is trying to say to you. That's where faith comes in. It's almost like that's a, 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 a confirmation that God is wanting to do whatever it was he said. Amen? Because otherwise the enemy would just leave it alone. He comes to deny whatever this word says. So you confess the word, you can bet that you're going to get some kind of sensory uh, response to deny whatever that word is. That's what the scripture tells us. That's what Jesus said. The moment the word is sent forth, the enemy immediately comes to steal that word, yes. to try to take it away from you, to keep it from producing what God intended for it to produce in your life. So don't be, don't be discouraged, amen? You keep saying what God has put in your heart, and it will come to pass. It has to eventually. Praise God. So the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works there is none that doeth good. I, I don't know if I told you, but Peter, I wanted 
go uh, all the way through verse 15 uh, and the second, or excuse me, chapter 15 and uh, verses 1 and 2. So we're in Psalms 14, 1. We want to go through Psalms 15, 1 and 2. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who, who eat up my people as they eat bread and care not upon the word or call not upon the Lord? There were they in great fear, for God is in the generations of the righteous. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. Lord, who shall abide? Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 12, or 10 through 12. Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Praise the Lord. That's encouraging, isn't it? Praise God. But for anything in Scripture to be true, there has to be a, a thread that is woven all the way through, from Old Testament through the New Testament. Sometimes we see things uh, in, the, in the New Testament that are referring to something of the Old Testament, but it's trying to give us a clearer understanding of it. Amen? And so uh, look at uh, Romans 3. Continue on in Romans 3. Let's look at verses 19 through 28. Romans 3, 19 through 28. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. There, where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Praise the Lord. So we're talking about, in the new covenant, the law of faith. The only law we have is the law of faith we talk about love as being the commandment, the only commandment in the New Testament, but it's the law of faith, all right? So look at verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. What law? Not, not the Ten Commandments, the law of faith. Praise the Lord. All right? Faith is the law of the New Covenant. Works are the law of the Old Covenant. Praise the Lord. And all Bible faith, every bit of Bible faith that there is, is right here. It's in this book. That's where we get it from. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. So let's look at 1 Corinthians now. 1, uh, 27 through 31. I know it's just kind of a kind of convoluted way of getting going here, but... Which, which verses? 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 31. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound them which are mighty. Things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things 
which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now it says that God chose. We didn't choose this method. God chose it. This is God's, this is his desire to do things. This is how he chose to do it. Praise the Lord. So let's look again at 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members particular. Now, uh, you can go to Isaiah 46 now, uh, Peter, 9 through 13. Isaiah 46, 9 through 13. So he says, now, this is after the resurrection. <coughs> Jesus has left. And Paul is telling us, now you're the body. Now you are Christ in this earth. You are the body, amen, of Christ. Praise the Lord. Each one of us is now God in the flesh, if you will. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. All, all of the fullness of the Godhead dwells in us bodily. Praise the Lord. So uh, in Isaiah 46, 9 through, th 9 through 3, excuse me. 9 through 13. Remembering the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Listen to me, you stubborn of heart, you who are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off, and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion, praise the Lord, for Israel my glory. I bring near my righteousness. It's not far off, and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. Praise the Lord. Look at verse 10 if you can, Peter. Declaring the end. Now, he said, remember the form of things of old. I am God. There's nobody like me. I'm God and there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. So how does God do things? He does it by saying. Now, we have received his image. We are the manifestation of God in the earth. We have received God's nature, his virtue, his righteousness. Amen. How? By saying. By saying what he says. Amen? My word will not come back to me void, right? So look, let's go now to Luke chapter 8. And I want to read verses 43 through 56. Story everybody knows is about the woman with the issue of blood and so forth. But again, I want us to see the, the church's place in this. The us. The body of Christ now. Amen. There was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. I, this is talking about the church. I mean, I know there was a woman who had this issue of blood, but this is talking about the church because the church, the life of the church is in the blood. And we're not operating in that reality. It's like we need a transfusion or something. I'm talking about the, the church as a whole. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And so the woman having an issue of blood, Jesus said, who touched me? And when everybody denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee and sayest thou, who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody has touched me because I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. In other words, what God is looking for is faith in the church. The only way to stop the issues that we have, amen, that are not aligning with Christ, that don't make us 
in the image of God is, is our lack of faith, is our unbelief, amen, that God would really use me or that God would actually use you or that God sees you as being righteous or sees you the same way he sees Jesus. The Bible says that he loves you exactly the way he loved Jesus. Now, it's hard for me to comprehend, but it is what the Bible says. Whether I understand it all or not is not really the point. So while he yet spake, there comes one from the, the uh, ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her, but he said, Weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. And he put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. So under the, under the Mosaic covenant, under the law, Jesus had just become unclean. She had an issue of blood. It was, it, she could have been stoned to death for even being out in public. And she, had, she could not touch anybody because in her condition, she was considered unclean by the law. And if you interact with other people or touch them or do things that the scripture told them not to do, then they could be stoned to death. So she was taking a, a great risk. Amen. And so uh, Jesus, based on the law, had just become unclean. Now, that's a fact. All you have to do is look at the law to see that that's the case because of her uncleanness. Praise the Lord. By contrast, and in fact, she became clean by the virtue that flowed out of him. He didn't become unclean by the blood that flowed from her. She became clean because of the virtue that flowed from him. Praise the Lord. And so, uh, goodness, power, if you talk about virtue... Here's what virtue is. It's goodness, it's power, it's right actions. In other words, it's righteousness. That's what flowed out of Jesus was righteousness. Amen? Praise God. And so this incredible change took place, and he said to her, your faith has made you whole. He didn't say it with that squeak, because he was past puberty, praise the Lord. <clears throat> but he said, your faith is what made you whole. He didn't, he didn't claim, you know, some great, look what I did. No, he said, your faith has just created this wholeness in you. Praise the Lord. Now again, we're talking about a church. I know it's a woman, but this is, just, this is, this is the church, I think, is, is the uh, metaphor that's being used here is this woman. Praise the Lord. And so once this woman is healed, some people can then come to, uh, to Jairus, who is with them, and they tell him, don't bother Jesus. Your daughter's dead. There's no point in pestering him now because she's already gone. And so terror grips J. Iris like it would anybody if you just heard you're here trying to get somebody to come and do something for your daughter and then you find out uh, she's dead. And they tell him, don't bother the master. And so he's in fear. And Jesus counters this thinking without J. Iris saying anything. Jesus responds and said, she's asleep. Just believe. She's only sleeping. Get it? Only believe. When this issue is settled in us, faith is going to make us whole. Faith is going to make us exactly what God has declared us to be. Even though we may not have seen it yet, we may not see it manifesting in all the areas that we would like to see it. But the moment we stop worrying and stop fretting and start, stop listening and, and looking at the situations that are around us and start believing... Amen. We're going to be whole. We're going to be this Jesus in the earth. We're going to be, amen, the body that God intended us to be right here and right now. Amen. When we believe only, when we don't let other stuff infiltrate us and dominate us and try to divert us from the path that Jesus has put us on. His word. Praise the Lord. Jesus is going to go to a sleeping church. Amen. When we believe only, he'll come to the sleeping church with the power of resurrection. Amen. And bring her to life. Yes, amen. Praise the Lord. Somebody's got to believe. If they hadn't believed, Jesus wouldn't have even have went to the house. Yes. The woman wouldn't have been healed in the first place. The, the, the young girl would have remained asleep. Jesus tells him then, he says, 
bring, bring Jairus' daughter some meat to eat. That's fascinating because he doesn't say bring her some milk. No. Right? Milk belongs to those not exercised in the word of righteousness. Praise the Lord. She has been given righteousness. Righteousness went into her just like it did the woman, amen, with the issue of blood. And just like it did for you and I when we got born again. Amen. Praise the Lord. The righteous, this, this whole issue of righteousness has been settled here in this particular scripture, amen. The woman and the young girl are now whole. They're what they're supposed to be. Praise the Lord. Amen. The righteousness we have is a gift. And we need to see resurrection life energize every part of our life, every part of our, our, our every area of our life, all of our situations, all of our cir circumstances, in every area of our body. Amen. We need to see resurrection life. This isn't something we're waiting for to happen. Uh, amen. When, when the rapture takes place, we're supposed to be experiencing resurrection life here and now. I'm not saying there won't be a rapture. I'm not saying that we won't experience some things there. I'm saying that right now and right here, amen, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. We have already received, amen, a resurrection life, amen, through Jesus Christ. And, and uh, it, with that comes healing and with that comes prosperity. With that comes deliverance. That's being made whole. Yes. That's the sozo that the, the scripture talks about. The bottom line is this. We're either in Adam or we're in Christ. That's, that's the key. It isn't a question of sin or not sin. It's about people are either in Christ or they're in Adam. If they haven't been born again, they're still in Adam. They're stuck with the consequences of Adam's uh, original sin and everything that has uh, followed it. Look at uh, 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 Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. Revelation 3 and 5. In the book of Revelation, it talks about us having received a new name. And a name just uh, symbolizes nature, a change in, in the person, right? So here he says, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, robe of righteousness, amen. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Have you ever th just tried to imagine this? And I know maybe, I, I think this is... This is true, right? But I'm trying to figure out how big this book is. Yeah. I mean, because it's got to have, right? If somebody's name's going to be blotted out, how long is it going to take to find that name? Right? I mean, I know that's maybe going a little too far overboard, but it just it seems bizarre to me that there's this name with everybody's, or this book with everybody's name in it. But I believe this symbolizes your changed name. The changed nature that you receive. Yeah. Empowered with the life of God. Amen. Yeah. Remember Abram? He, God said, I'm going to call you Abraham. The H, the H is from Jehovah. He was, give, he was putting his name into Abraham. Same with Sarai. Instead of the I, took the I out, the her, and put H in, which symbolizes again Jehovah. And so he gave a new name to them, and that new name was his name. Praise the Lord. And so uh, what's happening here, the name the Lord confesses is a new name and a new nature. And I think God only blots out one name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. That name's Adam. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Because everybody's either in Adam or they're in Jesus. He doesn't need all of our names. He just needs to know whose name is on you. Uh -huh. Whose name have you received? Amen. And that name is Adam. He doesn't possess the life. That person doesn't possess the life of the Lamb of God. He's in the Lamb's book of life, right? So that person doesn't have the life of the Lamb of God. And so his name is taken out, right? So then he writes only one name in. And that's Christ. Because if we're in Christ, amen, since we're all called by that same name, then that's the name that God sees on, on us. That's the name that he calls us by. Amen. That's why we become the body of Christ. That's why we have the nature of Christ. Amen. And so we're called by his name. We are included then in the Lamb's book of life simply because we were born again. So how about we just put on the Lord Jesus. Amen. Who is our righteousness. They were clothed in, in white raiment. Amen. And we just put on the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh. Amen? We're not talking about 
one too many beers. We're not talking about that stuff. We're talking about either being in Christ or being in Adam. And if you are in Christ, amen, we put on Christ. The righteousness is ours, amen, simply by our faith in God. Praise the Lord. I'm not saying we ought to live stupid, you know, and be ignorant. I'm just saying that is not the, the criteria here that God's using. He's saying you're either in Him or you're in Adam. If you're in Him, it's all cool. Amen? Jesus is our robe of righteousness. Praise the Lord. Make no provision for the flesh is simply meaning don't let your senses dominate you. Don't let your feelings, don't let your experiences dictate to you who you are and what you're, what you're capable of. Praise the Lord. He's got your name in the book. And your name is Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. Believe only is what he's telling us. Philippians 3, uh, verse 9 through 11. A lot of times, you know, we, we say we know things simply because we've heard it a lot of times. It doesn't mean we know it. You don't know it until you're doing it, until you're living it, until you're acting on it, right? And that's what, see, it's kind of, it's like college or university. You go to school, you, you get all this learning and everything else. And what does it mean? It means nothing until you apply it. It's just words. It's just information. Until you apply that to your life or to your job or your business or whatever it is, it's ha it has no real value. Right? And it's the same way with the Word of God. Until we act on it, until we believe it and begin to function as a result of that, it's just there. Praise the Lord. So he be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now look at this. By faith. I'm fa how are we found in him? Not because of my righteousness, not because of what I've done to be accepted by him, which, is, which would be by the law. If I did enough stuff for God then to be pleased enough to give me his life, I'd have to be perfect. But it doesn't happen that way. But that which is through the faith of Christ. Not even my faith. This is the faith we get. The Word. The Word made flesh, right? So that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I get no reward. Remember they talks about in heaven there's going to be this big deal and all the crowns are going to be passed out and everybody's going to get some glory and all. I don't believe so. Because whatever you get, it's going to be like the hot potato. Yeah. It's not mine. I didn't do this. Well, this is all about you. And that's why it says we cast all of our crowns or all of our perceived glory or effort or energy or whatever that we put into it. And we hand it right back knowing this was all about you, Lord. It wasn't what I did. It was what you have done. Amen. Yes. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, which is just the dealing with life, having to handle all the junk that you've go through, amen, and the fellowship of the suffering, made, being made conformable unto his death. Praise the Lord. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now I think a lot of times we've read that in terms of the rapture or when we die, you know, we're going to have... He's talking, this is about right now. Praise the Lord. Knowing Christ in the power of resurrection is going to bring life from the dead. We were born again. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. He has resurrected us and made us alive in Christ. We are now the righteousness of God in Christ. We are the body of Christ. We have this unbelievable power access to, and yet we don't use it. We act as though we're still dead. Praise the Lord. We need to touch the pastor. Amen. We need to believe only. Amen. So we can be whole. So we can be what this thing says we are. Instead of judging ourselves and measuring ourselves among ourselves and by ourselves. We need to look at this and say that's, that's what determines who I am. That is what defines me. Nothing else. See, the life of God. Just think the life of God. I mean, if we really understood that, it would so energize us. Yeah. Resurrection life yeah. will flow from your very being if you believe this. This is, what, this is what Peter was doing. It wasn't his shadow. 
It was resurrection life that flowed out of him and touched the blind man or the crippled guy, whatever, whoever, and whatever he was, and he was immediately healed. Peter didn't do anything. He said, don't look at me like it was something I did. It's Jesus. He said, this is resurrection life that just touched you. Amen. And if you knew it, this is what Jesus told the woman at the well. If you knew who it was you were talking to, you'd be asking me, because this water is life. This is, how, this is how you survive. You'd be asking me for water, and the water that comes from me is like a well of water springing up into resurrection life or everlasting life. Yes. Praise the Lord. So love, not fear, is the motivator. It's the factor that, that the people of God understand. Not fear, not worry, not threats from God or, you know, what can happen about this. or No, it's the love of God that's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And it's the love of God, amen, that, is, that gives us resurrection mentality. By knowing how much God loves us, we can believe, amen, that all things are possible. Yes. That nothing shall be withheld from us. Because He loves us just as He loved Jesus, like Tim was talking about. Jesus loves me. This I know you could say, well, it's a kid's... Uh, no, hey, that's a song for everybody. And it would be good for us as adults to embrace that and realize how much God really does love us. And then maybe we would step out and do things in faith, not fearing that we would fail, but knowing that our Heavenly Father will back us up all the way and accomplish whatever it is we're trying to accomplish. Amen. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says your external life, or what other people can see and experience, amen, might reflect righteousness. But your heart is far from it. Now he's talking to the, the Pharisees. And he's saying you look like you're about as righteous as anybody could be because you're dotting every I and crossing every T and you're not going here and doing that and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But he says, uh, he goes on to tell them in Matthew that if you righteous guys that are so righteous, if you look on a woman and the thought begins to roll through your mind, hmm, not bad. I'd like to get to know you. He says, you've already committed adultery, even though you've never touched her. This is something that's internal. It's not something that's external. He's talking about the spirit, praise the Lord. Jesus is looking beyond this works-based religious system into something that flows from the inner man, righteousness. Doesn't mean the thought will never come to you. It just means that the thought itself is as big a crime as the action as far as God's concerned. So what he's telling them is, you can't control every thought that comes through your head. You're going to need somebody to be an intermediary for you. You may be able to act the act and play the part, but you know deep down inside, i got the same evil as anybody else. I'm capable. Because Jesus said it's your thoughts. It's the inner part of you that I'm concerned about. It isn't so much the stuff that's going on, on the outside because you can, you can do all the right stuff. But that doesn't mean you've had any kind of change at all. It doesn't mean that God has really dominated your, your uh, reality, you know, who you really are. Amen? So it's about belief in his resurrection. That's what makes you the new man. That's what makes you like Jesus. Not your actions, not your behavior, not how good you are but what you have believed. Praise the Lord. Now, actions will follow generally, but I'm just saying that is not what God is measuring us by. He's measuring us by the resurrection life that we've received that has made us the body of Christ, that has made us the righteousness of God. Amen? So the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees is what we received as a free gift from God. They couldn't get it no matter what they did. The Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out. They couldn't be born again. So they were trying to do stuff physically that they thought would be acceptable to God. And God said, that's filthy rags. I don't even want to look at it. It's, it's human effort that cannot produce what only I can produce. Amen. So when we really believe that this is not about works, but it's about what he has done for us. 
And then we can then begin to live by faith. Then we're going to see Christ is living his life through us. Praise the Lord. We need to realize that Jesus is not reigning on planet heaven. He's reigning in your heart. He's reigning in your spirit. Praise the Lord. You are the temple of God. And he's ruling and reigning from there. That's why it says the kingdom of God doesn't come by observation. The kingdom of God is in you. He's ruling over the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is inside of you. He's seated on a throne. Praise the Lord. So the next thing Jesus would warn the disciples of would be the leaven of the Sadducees. He had just talked about the leaven of the Pharisees, which was their outward external rule keeping and, and law following and so on and so forth. And he says, unless, you're, unless your righteousness exceeds or is better than theirs, you'll never see the kingdom of God. Meaning they're not going to see the kingdom of God based on their righteousness because it wasn't enough. So the next thing that he warns them about is the leaven of the Sadducees. Look at uh, Matthew 16 and verse 6. The disciples were not getting any of this. They were, they were still thinking he was mad about not bringing lunch. Because he's talking about bread, you know. So then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. All right, uh, verse 12. Then they understood, then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, here's the deal. The key here is that the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That spirit is still prevalent in the church today. Praise the Lord. Even though a lot of churches, you know, teach physical resurrection or the rapture. Amen. They don't have a revelation of present day resurrection power in the life of believers. That's why they don't believe in healing. They don't believe in deliverance. They don't believe in anything supernatural. It's just maybe it'll happen if God's in a good mood that day or he happens to trip over your uh, situation. He might do something for you. No, they don't really believe in resurrection life. They believe in a resurrection to come, but not in a resurrection that has already taken place. And that's what Jesus came to give us. If he wanted to resurrect us, if he just wanted to get us to heaven, all he had to do was do it. This is about here. It's about him being in this earth. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Romans 8 and 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now he's not talking about resurrection to heaven here. He's talking about making your physical body as alive or in tune with your spirit. Your spirit's been resurrected and that's what he's wanting to do. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body, amen, by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So your body all of a sudden literally becomes the body of Christ. You begin to start doing what Jesus has done. You've been made alive to God. Praise the Lord. That's a present day re reality. That's a right now thing. When the very life of God is imparted to us, it's a different kind of life. Praise the Lord. You know, in my life, I've corrupted a lot of things. You know, I just messed it up. It, it, it should have gone a certain way, but I made a bad choice or decided selfishly for whatever reason, and I corrupted the thing that I was really after. Right? Well, we've been given a life that's incorruptible. That's the being quickened. The body being quickened. It can't screw this up. If we stay with the Word of God, we can't mess it up. We can't corrupt it. Because God has given us something that is incorruptible. Look at uh, 1 Peter 1.23. Praise God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Not from the seed of man, but from God. That's incorruptible. By the word of God. Right there. Which liveth and abideth forever. If we stay with this, it can't be corrupted. The enemy can't come and, and mess up the plan that God has for your life. See, there's a lot of people today that don't believe in a present resurrection. So they depend on their own strength, 
They depend on their own ability. They depend on their religion, right? Their, their good behavior. And God said, that is an abomination to me. Yeah. To see you reject my free gift of the righteousness of God and try to produce your own, it's, it's, it's like a mocking of God. It's like, like, it's like Israel did when God gave them the law. All of that, we can do it. Yeah. And immediately, the whole thing went to hell. Yeah. They had idols. They had all kinds of weird stuff going on. And, and God said, come near this mountain, you're dead. You've proven that it is impossible for you to keep any law. So I'm going to have to give you a bunch of sacrifices so that I don't have to punish you. We'll kill an animal, and I can push this stuff back for another year. But you're never going to be made righteous. Just the judgment for your unrighteousness will be put off until Jesus comes. Amen? Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Philippians 3, verses 2 and 3. Thank you, Jesus. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. He's talking about the Jewish teachers and leaders. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So Paul's saying he didn't have any confidence in his own ability or his own righteousness or his own religion. He goes on to say, if you want to know my credentials, and then he goes on, tells the whole story, you know, uh, of the house of Benjamin, blah, 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 but goes on and on and on about how he kept everything, did all this right stuff. And then he goes on to say, but it's all crap. It's all done. It's all a waste of time to try to gain Christ through that. To give it up and to just trust in him, I just need to wait and believe God and be found in him. Praise the Lord. By what Jesus did, not by what Paul did. So there's a life that flows from resurrection. And it's not normal life. It's not a usual life, praise the Lord. It's a God kind of life. A life that lives inside of us that's incorruptible. That the enemy cannot mess it. He can't screw it up. If we stay in faith. If we keep the faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Who do you say that I am? You know, that's a question we ought to be asking ourselves. It's not just what Jesus asked of everybody about him, excuse me. It's what we should be asking ourselves. Who do I say that I am? I am. The I am is in me. The I am dwells with He and I are one. I am. Praise the Lord. See, a, a revelation of this contains the keys of the kingdom. And what are the keys of the kingdom? The kingdom is where everything's done. The king has supplied every need, taken care of everything. So a revelation of, uh, amen, of, of, of Christ and my oneness with him contains the literal keys or the, the means by which I activate the kingdom of God in my life. For healing, for deliverance, for prosperity, for whatever it is, for whatever the need is that's here in the book. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Praise the Lord. You see everything being condensed. It's not multiple gods. This isn't the pantheon of Greece or someplace where all the gods hang out. There is one God. Here, O Israel, there is one God. Praise the Lord. And he's telling us who he is. Here's the names. Amen. The Prince of Peace. Heavenly Father. Praise God. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it. And to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Praise the Lord. So the gates of hell can't prevail against a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what the devil is about. He doesn't care how many gods you have. He doesn't care how much religion you have. He wants to keep Jesus out of the picture. Praise the Lord. And that's why we're seeing in the military now they can't even use the name of Jesus. And the chaplains, the, the ministry can't even use the name of Jesus. Amen. Without being punished. Amen. And everywhere else you go, they don't care what you call. Uh, call it uh, Xmas. Call it uh, Happy Holidays. Call it anything but Christ Mass. I mean, department stores changing their whole, you know, approach to, to, to selling all the junk they want to sell you at Christmas. But they don't want to use the name of Christ, so they try to sucker you in some other way. And, and this way it happens all the time is what they try to make you feel guilty or to feel bad about believing in one God. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking about, you know, I, I'm talking about there is only one God and His name is Jesus. He came to earth and His name is Jesus. Now, I'm not fighting against denominations here. I'm saying it's not Allah. It's not, uh, you know, some Indian uh, serif or something. It's not, it's not Muhammad. It's Jesus. Yes. Amen. I, we've said it plenty of times and we all know this. The devil doesn't care how religious you are. In fact, he, he loves every part of it. He's involved more in religion than he is in anything else. It's Jesus that he's concerned about because if you ever get a revelation of Jesus Christ, he's out of here. He's not going to be able to stand against you because you are incorruptible in Christ. You cannot be corrupted. Amen? It's not us, but it's the Father living and flowing in and through us. Walking in the truth of his word is going to keep us just, just walk in the Word. That's what will keep you. Just walk in the Word. Amen? That's walking by faith. When he says the just shall live by faith, you'll walk by faith. You do it by this, by the Word of God. Revelation 3, verse 9. I think I talked about, I taught on this at one point somewhere, but... I'm not really getting into all that other than just that it fits in with what we're talking about here. He says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So that this is the anatomy of the synagogue of Satan. And what it is, it's a shadow. These people, these are a shadow side of those that are indwelt as temples of God. These are people that are ruled and manipulated and controlled by Satan. And I gotta tell you, that could be a large part of what we call the church. Yes. I mean, when you see people claiming to be born again and they're promoting things that are so contrary to the word of God. I'm not talking about, yes, we need to be merciful, we need to love, we need to forgive, but we cannot just say it's okay when it's not okay. Now, we're not here to judge them. We're here to be merciful and to show love and so on and so forth. But I'm just saying there are those who are, who are claiming to be the synagogue of God when they are literally the synagogue of Satan. They are a place for Satan to operate from. Praise God. They're manipulated. They're controlled. They're, they're used by the devil. And this parallel, it parallels Romans uh, uh, 2. Look at Romans 2, uh, 28 and 29. Romans 2, verses 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God's asking, who's living in your house? Whose temple are you? See, all of these promises, all of the promises we find in here are to the seed of Abraham. And they said, we have Abraham to our father. He said, if Abraham was your father, you'd be... You'd be following me. You'd be listening to what I'm telling you. 
You're just claiming it because you think physically you are the, the progenity of, of, of Abraham. But you don't understand. Abraham wasn't ever received of God because of his genealogy. He was received because of faith. What, what did Jesus say? Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Mm -hmm. Whose daughter? Wasn't Jesus' daughter. Abraham's daughter. Yeah. She had a right to healing. Why was she Abraham's daughter? Because she was a Jew? No, because she came to him in faith. That's how he identified her as a daughter. Not because she had genetic uh, you know, proof of, of uh, Jewish heritage or he Hebraic heritage. She proved it by operating in faith. He said, that's a daughter of Abraham there. Praise the Lord. And Abraham was the father of faith. Abraham had two sons, remember? One came from a natural seed produced by human effort and ability, and the other came supernaturally by a promise from God, based on a promise from God that he believed, and that child came. Amen? That was the heir. Amen? Not the physical uh, reproducing of his seed. That didn't make it the heir. The heir came because of a promise from God that he believed. Praise the Lord. Galatians 3, verse 29. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And if he be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen? If you be Christ, if you're born again, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise that God gave Abraham. Amen? So as believers, you're not in the synagogue of Satan. You're an overcomer. Not based on your behavior, not based on your performance. You are a temple of God based on who's dwelling in you. Praise God. Based on the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. God's wanting us to climb into the mercy seat. You know, once a year, they would, for the, on the Day of Atonement, they would bring the blood from the offering and they'd come all the way through and they would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Jesus, one, one definition of Jesus is the mercy seat. Praise the Lord. He's one that brought grace that made it possible for us to enter in. So God's wanting us to climb into the mercy seat. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Praise the Lord. It'll, it'll be the 4th of July forever for somebody. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Remember where we started? Everybody's sinned. Everybody's come short of the glory of God. Amen? The word sin here means to miss the mark or come short of the glory. Yeah. Praise the Lord. The glory is what comes from entering boldly beyond the veil. That's where the glory was. That's where the glory showed up, amen, once a year. Was in the holiest of holies, in the place where the mercy seat was. That's why the high priest had to go in there. He couldn't open his eyes. He had to do everything by touch. And he had to, there, there were so many rules and regulations about it. He, they wouldn't even let him sleep the night before he performed that duty for fear that he would have a dream that would be unclean or he would have a thought that he couldn't control. And if he went in there, they tied a rope around his leg so that when he went in there, if he dropped over dead because he hadn't kept all the regulations that he was supposed to, they could drag him out without somebody else going in there and getting killed. Praise the Lord. But God is telling us, that's not how I want to operate. I want you to come boldly to the throne of grace. I want you to come without any fear of consequences in terms of punishment or judgment or, or any of that kind of thing. Praise God. He wants us to come boldly. He wants us to climb into the mercy seat the throne of God, to be seated with Him in heavenly places. Heavenly places is not somewhere out in space. Heavenly places is some, a spiritual reality that's right here and now. There is a people who's going to do this and bring manifestation of the glory of God and see that manifestation of the glory of God as the kingdom of God being released from our lives. There, there's, this, I believe this is the generation 
You know, when, when the woman that came with the issue of blood was made whole, Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. And immediately he goes to another generation, to the next generation. But here's the deal. Without that woman, without us being whole, there's no way to reach the next generation. You can't resurrect something without truth, without life, without the resurrection life. Jesus gives that life to the woman who came to him by faith. And immediately the next thing he does is go to the next generation and waken them up. They weren't. He said, she's not dead. This next generation isn't dead to God. It's just asleep to God. They just don't have an awakening. They need an awakening. Amen. And the only way that can happen is for the woman, amen, to get healed. Yeah. To have enough faith to come and believe God's going to do whatever it is we have need of as long as it's in this scripture. And the, one of the biggest things he wants to do is to reach the next generation. Because without them, amen, we're it. Praise the Lord. But I think if we reach that generation, if the, if the bride, the woman who has been resurrected or healed, amen, resurrection life will then flow to the next generation and they will come automatically yes. to God. There won't have to be, look, God went to them. She couldn't come to him. She was dead, according to everybody else. He says, no, she's not dead. She's just asleep. But I'll go to her, right? What does the, what does the scripture say? No man cometh to God except by the Spirit. The Spirit has to come first to move upon them, to give them an awareness of God, an awakening to God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's resurrection life. Not, we're not talking about just in a geographic realm, you know, here on planet Earth. We're talking about in our lives, in our hearts, in our relationships, in everything that we do, God is revealed. Amen. A place where we are literally seated together with him in his throne. And then together we have become heirs of the grace of God. Ruling and reigning with him is what the scripture says. Last scripture here, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. See, I mean, even back then, even in the uh, time when Jesus was here on earth, it wasn't what he was trying to tell me. It's not what you're doing. It's what, it's what you're aware of. Here, all of the things that you've been preaching and teaching for a thousand years, uh, whatever it was, is right here in front of you, and you're not aware of it. That's the problem. The problem isn't how much you can do or can't do. The problem is... What are you aware of? Are you aware of what Jesus has done for you? Are you aware of what Jesus wants to do through you? That's what will change everything. Not what you're doing, but what you're aware of. What you know can be done, right. amen, if you believe it. Yes. And has raised us up together and made us sit together <clears throat> in the mercy seat, in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. It's done. Praise God. Resurrection life, now, that's what he's telling us. As he is, so are we in this present world. Behold. Oh, praise God. Only believe. That's it. That's the key. That's Christianity. It has nothing to do with the rules and all the rest of that. Because, hey, look, he's even said, what, what may be sin for you isn't necessarily sin for them. What might be sin for them isn't necessarily sin for you. The Holy Spirit will deal with you about it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not going to be specific, but I don't know what it is. But for some people, it doesn't. Bo this doesn't. Bo a certain behavior doesn't bother them. They're not affected by it. But this person over here, that same behavior may ruin their life. Right. You know what I mean? It's a. It's. It's. We're individuals with God, so you can't just write down a list of do's and don'ts because they don't apply to, equally to everybody. The only thing that's equal, the only thing that applies equally is Christ. He has made us all equal. All heirs of God. All children of God. Heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. Let's believe. huh? Let's just believe and watch what God will do with us and through us. Amen. That's the plan. Amen. And he alone can do it. Incorruptible life. Life that cannot be messed up. Praise the Lord. Go in the power of his might. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Enjoy the music.